the book of Luke. The book of Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. Uh, I encourage you this morning to listen. Uh, You can listen at a number of levels. Uh, You can be listening and your head can be somewhere else. Uh, So we're going to pray because it's an opportunity to, you know, as you listen, say, Lord God, is this a message for me? Is this something that I can, is practical for my life? Is this something that can draw me closer to you? Is this something that can make me more effective for you? Because the reality of the Christian life is is it's all about Jesus. Um, It's all about him. We were created for his image. Uh, We were created for him, rather, in his image, uh, for his glory. But we've got competing conflicts because uh, this system, this world that we're brought into, uh, teaches us uh, about me. How do I get happy, how do I be good, how do I, and so, you know, we're going to look at a a guy today, Uh, he's affectionately referred to as the rich fool, and we'll read from the book of Luke, chapter 12, 13 to 21. Uh, Before we do, but we will pray. Father, we thank you for this day, in Jesus' name. Uh, We do thank you for your goodness and your kindness. Uh, We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Father, as we read, Lord, and as we uh, share uh, from your word, Lord, your principles, I thank you, Lord, that you would speak to the hearts of your people. Uh, Bless your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Reading from the book of Luke, chapter 12, uh, 13 to 21, it says these words, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. I want to speak to you today about uh, this guy, um, and it's not so much the money I want to speak to, it's an attitude of the heart that I want to share with you, Uh, because your heart attitude is what's really, really important here. The way that you think between your ears, the way that you process information, the way that you, you know, understand things is really important. And one of the things that is most devotive in our lives, you've got family, you've got all sorts of things, but money and greed is a really powerful um, emotion in our society. And and surprisingly, Jesus actually said a lot of things about things that motivate us, including money. The Bible says more about money than about our need for faith. The Bible says more about money than about our need for prayer. It's amazing. The Bible says more about money than it does about heaven or hell. 16 of the 38 of Christ's parables deal with money. And more and more, and more is said. We see that a lot is said about money. And we think, why, why is it that it says so much? And it's because it's such an emotive subject. Money is enough. The need for money is enough for most people to get up out of their beds and go to work. It's enough for most people to want to do things so that they can survive and they have to survive. But we, I want to share with you today because if you're not careful with the money, you won't own the money, money will own you. If you're not share with your gifting, your gifting will own you, you won't own it. If, and you need to have a balance, a godly balance in the way that we live our lives and the way that we go forward in Jesus' name. In verse 13, it says, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, "Who, man, who appointed me to be a judge or an arbiter between you? You know, Jesus was speaking about eternal concepts, 
Jesus was speaking about love. He was speaking about eternal concepts. And he would have been speaking to a whole crowd of people about, you know, when you die, you go to heaven, forgiving, love, all these sorts of things is what Jesus was interested. And from the crowd, someone said to him, Lord, I've got a problem with my brother. And he wanted Jesus to intervene on on a worldly sort of matter. And that's not a bad thing if your heart's in the right spot. But you see, Jesus discerned that perhaps this guy's heart wasn't in the right spot. And so to me, more than anything else, is you need to guard your heart in Jesus' name. You need to guard your heart because your heart can be uh, a wonderful... um, And by heart, I don't mean your organ that's going like this. I mean your attitude, the way that you process things, the things that become important to you. You need to guard that. You know, above all else, the Bible says, guard your heart. Because you got, your heart can be hardened, your heart can become insensitive to certain things. And, and this man wanted Jesus to, to intervene, and, and the, the way that Jesus did is he told a story, and it was a parable about, um, about something that was relevant to this guy, about something that would make it happy, because somehow this guy would have reasoned that if he has his inheritance done, perhaps he would be happy. And I'm here to tell you today that money is not going to make you happy. The things of this world is not going to make you happy. But the world out there seems to think that it does. And so when you do things the right way, things fall into place. When you do things the wrong way, things don't fall into place. In verse 15, Jesus says, Then he said to them, Watch out and be on guard against all kinds of greed. And when you're greed, greed doesn't limit itself to just money. I want you to make that clear. You can be greedy in your relationships. You can be greedy in your me time. You can be greedy in all sorts of areas. And Jesus doesn't want us to be greedy people. Jesus wants to be people of love. That's why the Bible says, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. But you've got to express that love. It can't just sit deep, deep down in here. Yeah, it can't just be here. You've got to be able to show your love. You've got to be able to express the love that you have. Jesus uses the word watch out. He said, when he says watch out, the Greek word for that means horeo. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Horeo. I've even got a computer program that you preach and it says it. So I know it's right. You settle down, Brother Peter. <laughs> it's not in Russian, so just relax. But uh, it means to see with the eyes, uh, to see with the mind. It means to perceive and it means to know. I'll read that again. It means to see with the eyes, to see with your mind, to perceive and to know, to see, to look to, to take heed, to beware, to care for, to pay heed to. So Jesus wanted us to say, Jesus, I'm be careful. Be careful that it doesn't become you. I need to be careful that I, my faith is a genuine faith and doesn't become religious. I'm so careful with the church that the church doesn't become just a religious institution. You know, if you're not careful, somewhere along the, time, along the way, a religious organism can become a religious organization. God wants us to have, be not an organization. He wants us to be an organism, something that, alive, that is alive and something that's well. So Jesus uh, says, that, he says, watch out for what? that you're not motivated by greed, that you would degrade yourself into not being able to see what is important to God and value, uh, and value his, his relationship above all else. And then he says he told them a parable. Now, what's a parable? A parable is a story that illustrates a moral or a spiritual lesson. So he said, I'll tell you a story. This is what it's like. So he goes and he says that, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. So he tells them the story of the rich man who has an abundant harvest. All of us will go through good times and all of us will go through bad times. Uh, Some people like to focus on the bad times coming into church. Some people like to focus on the good times. I'm sort of an up sort of guy. (laughs) So I like, to positive, I like to concentrate on the positive. You know, people coming in, there's some people coming in this room 
whose, whose hearts would be really heavy going through difficult stuff, all that sort of stuff. And, you know, we need to, you know, I guess comfort the afflicted and, and love and encourage because people go through stuff and that's life. Other people are on the mountaintop. And, you know, things are going great, things are wonderful, and, and the responsibility of the church is to encourage them to go on in Jesus' name, and how do we maximise our giftings? How do we maximise the potential? How do we maximise our lives before God? How do I know that I'm in the right place? How can I know that I can yield not only a, cop, a crop of 30%, but of 70% and of 100%? And so people coming in will always be at different stages with their walk with Jesus, Sometimes by design, sometimes because I muck up, sometimes because God wants to deal with me. But, you know, we'll always be at different uh, places in our walk. But here we see that this guy was going through a good time. It was a time of abundance. It was a time that was wonderful. The sad fact of the matter is that most people forget God in the good times, but they kind of remember God when they go through the hard times. And we see that again and again and again in Scripture. When things are going good, we sometimes are not as focused on God. And sometimes it's almost like God allows us to go through difficult times so that we remember Him. You know, you look at the story of Joseph. Joseph wasn't successful all the way through. He was rejected by his brothers. He ends up in a pit. He gets to Egypt. Then he gets uh, uh, you know, accused of raping someone that he never did. He ends up in jail and all these sorts of things. And somehow, with a, a godly attitude, he's able to make it all the way to where God wanted him to be. Joseph understood, and he kept his attitude where God wanted He guarded his heart. He didn't allow it to, to be broken. And so we need to protect our heart and understand, you know, uh, a, a lot of Bible scholars will tell you that uh, in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says that you need to go out to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And we see that 50 days after Christ was put on the cross, there was Pentecost, a wonderful outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the disciples were full of the Holy Ghost, and they preached, and the church was going great, and the church was full, and they were all having a wonderful time. The time of revival, 3,000 people gave, came to the Lord, everything was wonderful, the church was growing, miracles were happening, the Holy Spirit was falling, everything was wonderful. Uh, but it's almost like they forgot to... They got the Jerusalem right, but the Judea, the Samaria, and the ends of the earth, it, was, it, d- it didn't happen because they had a good churchy time. And, and, and God, at best, depending on the way you read the book, God allowed a persecution to come through. And when the persecution came, they did go out because they feared for their life, so they bolted <laughs> because they wanted to live. And they brought the gospel with them, and the world was changed. And so sometimes we need to understand that in your heart, we need to keep our lives always focus on Jesus. Because the danger is when things go good, sometimes we forget about the Lord. And when we forget about the Lord, sometimes we don't make decisions that are in keeping with His will. Sometimes we don't call. We're going to look at that a little bit later. And so this guy here, it, the issue is when you read it, it says, he thought to himself, what shall I do? And it's not bad to think, what shall you do? Because God gave you a brain. You got, everyone's got two ears, right? You've got a skull, and in there is a thing called the brain. God gave that to you. Use it in Jesus' name. Can I hear you say amen? amen? You're supposed to use your brain, and your brain is not a bad thing. God uses it. He wants you to use it, you know? And, and you need discernment. If some guy comes to you and he says, oh, Rob, I've got a great plan. You invest uh, 300 bucks and you're going to get $300,000 by the end of the year. I would question him greatly because, you know, you've got to have a brain in your head. And people, you know, you look and and you've got to understand. But on top of that, we need to be people that are in tune with the Holy Spirit. And, And so whilst God gave me a brain, I use it, I discern it, I need to say, Lord Jesus, is this your will? Is this your will? And and that godly balance, the Christian lives in that tension of developing your mind but submitting yourself to the Holy Spirit. You know, at the other extreme, you'll get a whack job that'll, you know, Lord Jesus, do you want me to eat wheat bix or cornflakes? Speak to me, our Lord, right? You don't get a body like this by thinking like that, let me tell you. (laughs) There's some decisions you make for yourself, but, you know, people will say that. You know, what do I eat? What do I do this? So you need to have a godly balance in the way that you do things. But I would suggest to you very strongly that you need to say, you need to have a hard attitude that says, Lord Jesus, 
These are the things. I, this is what I feel. Lord, what do you want me to do? Lead me, guide me. But we don't see that with this guy here. He says, I thought to myself, what shall I do? Proverbs chapter 16, verse 3 says, Commit your ways to the Lord. Commit your plans, rather. Or commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. When you don't commit your plans to the Lord, I've written here, you run the danger of making a decision that is your own mind, and there can be consequences, dire consequences, if we make the wrong decision. You know, Galatians 6, 7, understand what you sow is what you reap. What you sow. Does God love me? Absolutely. But he loves me enough to teach me. He loves me enough to let things get my attention so I don't come keep walking down the road of delusion and walk down and understand. He does things to get my attention. And, and so that's why we need to be in touch with him. In uh, the book of Joshua, chapter 9, verse 14, an amazing story. Joshua's got to be one of my absolute favorite characters in the entire Bible. He was a warrior. He was a fighter. He did a 40-year apprenticeship under Moses. Finally, he becomes the leader. The first time we see uh, Joshua, he's got a sword in his hand and he's leading the army of the God. And so he's, he's got his act together. He's a warrior. He's a fighter. You know, one of my favorite stories with Joshua is uh, when he's in the promised land, the people, an angel stood before him. Some people are pre Christ appearance of angel. And Joshua is that focused on what he's got to do that he pulls out his sword and he says, are you for me? Are you for the armies of the Lord or against me? He didn't care. He, had a, he, he knew what God wanted him to do, and he was going to go forward regardless. And so I love Joshua. He, you know, he, he took the land against insurmountable odds. He did, and we hardly see any mistakes in Joshua's life. But there was a little glitch. And, and we see in um, Joshua chapter 9, verse 14, that he falls into a trap. And what happened was that, that the message from God was very, 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 very direct to Joshua. He said to Joshua, as he said to Moses, the people where you're going, the land is vile. You know, man, they're demon worshippers. They eat their children. They are ungodly. Whatever you do, do not mix with these people because if you mix with them, if your children intermarry with them, he says, they will corrupt you. And, and it's not that God hated these people, but they were just gone. It was just, and God had to deal with it. We apply that to our lives today here that what does that mean for us? It means you've got to be careful. Jesus said, be in the world, but not of the world. You know, we shouldn't say, I'm better than that person. You know, Christianity, evangelism is just one beggar giving another beggar a piece of bread. But you've got to have your brains as well. So you don't do, you don't go to places, don't be part of things where it's not going to be a godly atmosphere. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to encourage uh, the kids to go, oh, what are you going to do tonight, Dad? Oh, I'll just go to King's Cross, we'll go to a nightclub, we'll hang out. Doesn't work, does it? What are you going to do tonight? Oh, I'm going to go with my bikey mates and we'll just tour around and like, well, <laughs> you know, it's not going to work. Do you know what I mean? We need to understand that you need to, um, you need a bit of wisdom with what you do. You need to love the Lord with all your heart. And so God said to these guys, he said, be careful because it's a trap. And Joshua, uh, what happened was these people were, or the other side of it was the people in the land were terrified of the Israelites. They were absolutely terrified of the Israelites because God's favor was on them. And the, a group of people called the Gibeonites said, we're going to die. <laughs> So they wanted to fool the Israelites. So what they did is they put on old tattered clothes, they got old bread, they got old wineskins, they looked like they'd been walking forever and they went to the Israelites and they said, and they said, oh, you know, we've come from a far distant land, have mercy on us, you know, we want to be with you. And, and Joshua makes the biggest mistake of his life. In 9.14 it says, the men, of, the men of Israel sampled their provisions, but they did not inquire of the Lord. So they used their intellect, part A, tick, good, but they didn't inquire of the Lord. And sometimes things will look good on the outside, but they're not good on the inside. God knows I've made the mistake. <laughs> I, I speak from bitter, bitter experience, where on the outside, things look great and wonderful, and you go in for it, and man... You know, you, you don't spend the right time. It looks too good to be true. There's pressure on you. You've got to do it, bang. You make a decision and you're gone. And, and if I speak with all of you, I think we're all guilty of doing that. We're all guilty of doing that. 
You know, everyone here would have bought something that they shouldn't have bought. They would have committed to something they shouldn't have done. They would have got into a relationship that they... You know, you can apply this to relationships. You can apply this all across the board that what we need to do is understand, inquire of the Lord, Lord Jesus, what is your mind in this circumstance? What is your mind in this situation? So the lesson to learn is to make sure that you let God in on the decision-making process. That's not really hard. We need to make sure that we let God in on our decision-making process. In verse 18, I love this. This is a real reflection of the guy's attitude. And I've sort of bolded and made a bit bigger the eye. It says this, Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down the barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And then I'll say to myself, You... This is where I get scared. Now he's talking in the third person, right? <laughs> so he's delusional. You, you know. You ever get a person talking in the third person? Be afraid, right? Just be scared. Be ready to run or call someone or whatever. But, you know, in verse 19, he even goes into the third person. There's a heck of a lot of eyes up there. I don't see anywhere, Lord, what is your will for my grain? I don't see anywhere... Well, Lord, what is your will for my life? Every person here has got a gifting and ability. You were created for a purpose. And I, wanted to, I would be uh, incorrect, I would be wrong, if I don't encourage you to challenge yourself and say, God, what is my life about? Is it about me or is it about you? It doesn't mean you're not successful. Man, I pray that you guys are extremely successful. I'm not saying here it's bad to make money. I think it's great to make money. Lord, bring, you know, you, I pray for you guys all the time. But you've got to get the balance right. You've got to get the balance right in your, in your work career, in your relationships. Man, I, I've grown up in church and I've seen kids that love the Lord. They get into a wrong relationship. It looks great. It looks wonderful. And, man, they go down a road where they just walk away from the Lord. It's not the other person's fault. It's their fault because they haven't looked to Jesus. You know, God's merciful, God's great, God's wonderful, but we've got to make decisions that are, you know, I want to challenge you with how you make your decisions, your godly decisions, because we need to understand that. A heck of a lot of eyes up there. The rich man was self-centered, and he had no concept of others, at least in this, from what we can see here. He didn't worry about his family. I don't see family, I don't see children, I don't see, not the community, not helping the poor. It was all about him. And so the problem is, is that I can be like that if I'm not careful. Lord Jesus, what is me? <laughs> yeah, I can even be that about my preaching and my ministry gifting. And I can be, Lord Jesus, it's not about serving, it's about how can I best use my gifting and, and worry about me. And the, It's rubbish. You need to be connected with God. If you're connected with God and if you've got a humble heart, God will bless you. You'll walk in the, in the will of God, but you need a godly humility. A person called Sir Fred Catherwood, he wrote these words, Greed is a logical result of the belief that there is no life after death. We grab what we can while we can and then hold on to it very, very hard. I'll read that again. Greed is a logical result of the belief that there is no life after death. We grab what we can while we can, however we can, and then we hold on to it hard. So we need to really understand that our heart is really, really important here. And the only way you remedy that is you have a relationship with God. But you also got to put it... Because I don't think most people consciously set out to make bad decisions. I don't believe people like me, like you, consciously say, oh, I'm not going to use God in this decision. And no one I know does that. You know, there's a few crazy guys, I guess, that would, but no one really does that. What we do is things come along, we get busy, we get distracted, we get sidelined, we're rushing world, bang, 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 and before you know it, we go down a path, we're in a relationship, we've bought a thing, we've committed to something, and before you know it, we're down this journey and we're going, how did I get here? How did I, what did I do? What have I done? And you don't mean to do it. And what, but I, so I want to encourage you, this will give you the tools to avoid that. If you're praying to God, if you're in touch with God, if you're getting counsel, godly counsel, it helps you to avoid uh, the sort of pain. There's a story by a guy called Leo Tolstoy, and he wrote about a successful peasant farmer who wasn't satisfied with his lot in Russia. There you go, Brother Peter. 
Right? He wanted more of everything. He wasn't satisfied, so he wanted more of everything. And one day he received a, a novel offer from a, a rich guy that was passing through. He said, give me a thousand rubles. And he said, he could, you can buy all the land that you can walk around in a day. The only catch to the deal was that you have to be back at the starting point by sundown. So here's this guy, he's a farmer, he's a really greedy guy, and they have a deal. You can have all the land you want, so long as you walk it and you're back to the starting point by sundown. The story goes, early the next morning he started out walking at a very fast pace. By midday he was very tired, but he kept going, covering more and more ground. Well in the afternoon he realised that his greed had taken him far from the starting point he quickened his pace, and as the sun began to sink low in the sky, he began to run, knowing that if he did not make it back by sundown, the opportunity to become an even greater or bigger landholder would be lost. As the sun began to sink the horizon, he came, down, he came within sight of the finishing line. Grasping for breath, his heart was pounding. He called upon every bit of strength left in his body, and he staggered across the line just before the sun disappeared. He immediately collapsed, blood streaming from his mouth, and a few minutes afterwards he was dead. Afterwards, his servants dug a grave. It was not much more than six feet long and three feet wide. I mean, we can do that spiritually if we're not careful. I can do that spiritually if I'm not careful. And so you need to make sure that the deceit and the things of this world don't overcome you. There's a story here on how to, an article on how to be miserable. How to be miserable, it says, think about yourself. Talk about yourself. Use I as often as possible. You ever talk with people like that? It's all about them. You can't get a word in. I did this, I did that. So there's an article on how to be miserable. Talk about yourself. Use I as often as possible. Mirror yourself continually in the opinion of others. Listen greedily to what other people say about you. Expect to be appreciated. Be suspicious. Be jealous. Be envious. This is how to be miserable, by the way. Be sensitive to slights. Never forgive a criticism. Trust nobody but yourself. Insist on consideration and respect. Debate on agreement, on agreement with your own ideas and your own views on everything. Sulk if people are not grateful to you for favours you've shown to them. Never forget a service you have rendered Shirk your duties if you can and do as little as possible for others. That's how to be miserable all the time. So, I want to, so, so we don't want to be miserable, we want to be positive. So we need to ask ourselves, are the decisions that we make including the God factor? Do I include the decisions that I'm doing? Is God part of that decision-making process? Or is it about other things? Are the decisions we make about Him or about us? As John the Baptist said, he must increase, but I must de decrease. There's a story about a husband and wife at a party. She says these words, My husband and I have managed to be very happy together for the last 20 years. I guess this is because, because we're both in love with the same man. You guys don't get it. <laughs> I'll read it again. <laughs> right? My husband and I have managed to be happy together for the 20 years. I guess this is because we're both in love with the same man. In other words, he loved himself. It was all about him, right? So we need to make sure that when God challenges us, we, we, we're aware of what we're doing with our talents and our giftings, uh, with our relationships, with our finances, every single area of our life, we need to make sure that we've got the checks and balances in place. Because if you don't, you can go down a way that is not godly. In verse 20, it says this, But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. So is it wrong to store things up for yourselves? The answer is no. Of course it's good. It's wonderful. I think it's wonderful if you can store up things for yourself. But you need to understand that you need to be rich towards God. That's the caveat. In other words, God first if you're rich towards yourself and poor towards God, you're in trouble. But if you, if you, if God's got to come first. That's the bottom line. Love God because you all have giftings, you all have abilities, and God can use you. See, here it says expect the unexpected. You need to understand that we live in the economy of God. 
And, and God is of not, uh, not finite values, but God lives in the infinite values. So when we focus on God, when we concentrate on Him, He will lead you out, He will guide you, your joy will be complete. There's a verse in uh, Revelations, uh, sorry, we'll go to Isaiah 41 verse 10, and it says these words, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isn't that a wonderful promise? We need to, I need to rely less on myself, and we need to rely more on God. We need to trust Him with His decisions. Because this morning, it doesn't matter where you're at now, God sees you in a wonderful light. Uh, I, I copied this thing, and it was just was a very quick list of the people that God used. Because it doesn't matter where you're at, the wonderful thing is that God is a God of mercy and grace. Uh, Jacob was a cheater. Jacob was the grandson of Abraham. And he was a downright liar and a cheater. Peter had a temper. I'm not going to get people to lift up their hands all the time, otherwise we'll be in a bit of trouble. Because who's got a temper? Who's got who's cheats? Uh, David had an affair. Noah got drunk. Jonah ran away from God. Paul was a murderer. Gideon was insecure. Miriam was a gossip. Martha was a warrior. Sarah was impatient. Elijah was moody. Moses stuttered. Zacchaeus was short. I don't know what the problem with that is, but anyway, first of all. <laughs> that's a bit cruel. <laughs> don't worry, Dad, it's okay. <laughs> so Abraham, Abraham was old, and Lazarus was dead. But somehow, miraculously, God used every single one of them. Isn't that beautiful? You know, we would look at these people today, we would look at them and we'd say, out, I want nothing to do with them. He cheated, I don't want nothing to do with him. He lied, I don't want nothing to do with him. You know, you pick any one of them. He was a doubter, they were worried, oh, they're negative, keep away. But somehow God used them. I wonder if we got the grace to do that sort of stuff. Because it's normal to do that. That's what you need to understand. I think sometimes Christians are very hard on themselves. You know, Jesus, uh, Jesus, in the Word, in Isaiah, it says, a bruised reed he will not break. So in this church, we need to be full of God's grace, full of God's mercy. We need to love and accept each other. Everyone in this room is on, and I hate to say it, but we're on a journey. It really is true. And we, we, we need to come closer to the image of God. And what you need to do is guard your heart. Worship Him, honour Him, praise Him because He loves you with a love that just cannot be explained. You were created for His kingdom, for His good and for His, for his sake. And the problem is, the strategy of the devil is that He takes your eyes off Him and puts it on you, on your circumstances and your reasons. So, you know, in closing, I encourage you more than anything else, go for God. Spend time with Him. Understand His presence. Understand His joy understanding your daily life. And it can start from today. It can start when you walk out the door. It can start even from tomorrow at your work situation. All you need to do is, Lord Jesus, I pray, lead me, guide me in Jesus' name. Whatever it is that, that works for you, you need to do. But don't ever lose that God factor in your life. Be, have a sweet relationship with the Lord. Love Him and, and, and He will encourage you because His Holy Spirit is for you today. In Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Wonderful. Lord. Father, we do thank you today in Jesus' name uh, for your mighty love and your presence. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the power of your word. I thank you, Lord, that uh, your word would do us good. I pray for every person in this room. And, Lord, I do pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would touch their hearts. Uh, I pray, Lord, that we would make decisions that are consistent with your word. Father, we give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. And all God's people said...